Okay, so today we are going to meet with Dr. Lin Kuo, and I'm excited to speak with her about bowing technique. I've got five or six different ideas about how our bowing technique can be different when we're improvisers, whether we're playing fiddle music, whether we're playing jazz. Huge differences that affect not only rhythm, sound, our confidence, and our psychology when we're playing. And I want to get Dr. Lin's uh, input because she is someone who really helps elite classical violin players to win auditions and be like even more elite. Before we jump into it, I just want to mention our sponsor, Electric Violin Shop. If you go to electricviolinshop.com, you can find anything you need when it comes to electric violins, pickups, gear. Their phone number is at their website. They'll just help you with anything. Thanks to them for sponsoring. So, Dr. Lynn Kuo, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. This is exciting. This is our first collaboration, right, Chris? I guess so. We've known each other for years. I've admired all the content you're doing on YouTube. I think your videos are amazing. And I love your free PDF. People can find it at your website and all that stuff. I just have, to, just have to mention to your viewers and your listeners that I attended your workshop how many years ago? Live in Toronto. And I want to say thank you because you changed the way I think about harmony. You changed the way I think about technique. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, so I'm going to jump into the bowing thing. Obviously, I feel like as classical violinists, which we both had classical training, I feel like one of the biggest ideas with classical technique is just learning to use a lot of bow, which I think is great. There's reasons for just playing like big, long bows. Even if I play like a song like this. That requires a lot of bow, right? Yeah, totally. One of the first things that I recommend if we're making the change and we're going to be improvising is to use less bow. Let me find a loop here that I can pull out. So this is a little loop. That same kind of long melody that I just <laughs> did with a lot of bow, I would do it now. I'm going to turn up my amplification and I'm going to do a lot less bow. Right, so less bow and less bow changes. I guess this isn't the best example. Maybe a better example would be like Tchaikovsky because they don't save the bow as much, you know? They're kind of moving the bow fast. They're using a yeah. lot of bow, making a huge yeah. sound. And I feel like the purpose of playing in classical music, the way we're trained to use a lot of bow is because we're trying to fill a hall, an ac yeah. acoustic hall. But if we're amplified, we don't need to do that. Oh, I totally 100% agree because the classical priority is sound production. And so you can't get good sound production until you learn how to control the bow from frog to tip. But I can see where if you're amplified, why do you even need that? So wouldn't it be cool if in a jam session and you had just had some kind of long, long note and then you were able to control have that dynamic control that kind of thing only comes with long tone training right just being able to control your bow from frog to tip if people spend a lot of time improving their improv chops but not enough time on bow control which you do need yes you're, you're right i agree with you you probably don't need to play the swan like a classical cellist right i think it's not the priority but to be able to do that can set you apart from a lot of other instrumentalists you can use long tones as a warm-up an entry point into your practice session some people say i don't get to practice very much don't have much time to practice i really need to count so that's where i start to talk about making your practice more efficient and that's where that practice guide comes in where i have that free download on my site i have a methodology and a mindset about entering into your practice session so that you're optimizing what you're doing so whether it's learning learning how to, to chop or learning how to improvise to get into an efficient and focused mindset when you practice. Maybe you can combine the two. And I love how you have that mindset where you combine improvisation with technical practice. In my opinion, you could take long tones as your opportunity to focus your mind and then spend a minute, two minutes, three minutes just on long tones and that will help clear your mind, move from the previous chores you had to do in the day or the commuting you had to do and move into a productive practice session. Make the long tones your 
pre-practice meditation, which I actually do for myself and with my students. I learned from you. I took all your combined and multitask philosophy. <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks. Okay, I want to take this next loop here. Let's see what this sounds like. Yeah, the first thing I was talking about is the idea of using less bow. And I'm going to demonstrate it with this groove because it's a faster groove. So for people that can see in the video, it's very little bow. And, yeah. and I'm gonna just demonstrate again so people can look for how little bow I'm using. Very little bow. Very little bow, except when the, when the, when you went down, you went down to the frog and used your entire bow. So that's when you actually need to be able to control your whole entire bow with long tones. If I were to play that like a classical player, they would use more bow the entire oh. time. Like I'm using the full bow, but I'm using very yeah. little of it as I move. Right? They would be playing like. <laughs> right. Sounds right. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, and the amount of bow you know, that I'm using, it's really conserved. And part of the reason that I like to do that is because it allows me to be more rhythmic, to focus on my rhythm. But the second thing I would say is that I change the bow less. So that's another example, right? You know, this is kind of like changing the bow a lot yeah. versus hooking and slurring. So hooking and slurring the bow. For people who are listening, they can't see. So I can see that you're actually portato, down, 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 up, yeah. up, up, Yeah, and I love that conservation because you're actually being, that shows me that you have good bow control because you're able to stop, start all in one down bow. I mean, that's the beginning of what? Up bow staccato and things like that and down bow staccato. But that's really cool. I like to see that, to have a visual because lots of people spend a lot of bow or they waste a lot of bow. And I like the fact that you're able to control. I can see that's a good skill to have. And I can see that actually can be difficult for some people. Because I think it's instinctive for people to go back and forth, like you said, right? But that would be more difficult to be able to control. So let me ask that. Does hooking, when it's slow, is that hard or is that easy? I don't think it's hard, but I think the brain, I think instinctively right. wants to go the other direction. Well, I think that's something that we learn from practicing. I don't yeah. think it's actually hard. I just think that's what's familiar to people. So yes, changing our habit. And, and that yeah. actually is, an, is another point that I would make is that we play Boeing's habitually either going down, up, down, up all the time or reading the Boeing that's given to us. So if a Boeing is not given to us and we just get blank music paper, like let's say it was written for a vocalist or something. So there's no right. Boeing's, right? Then typically as classical violinists, our instinct will be to go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And so wow. what I like to recommend to people is, and this I guess will be the third point, is practice improvising your bowings and maybe this is something you could try and, and tell me how it resonates for you i'm going to show you what i mean so we take like a scale line like this and i'm going to just repeat it over and over but i'm going to improvise the bowing different every time so for example i could do all slurred by eight i could do three slurred one separate I could do So do you understand the exercise? Totally. Yeah, you're making up bowings on the spot. I think for maybe a classical trained person, they're not accustomed to creating bowings on the fly like that because I think the coordination might be an issue. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's actually a left hand, right hand thing to be able to 
coordinate without having miscoordination between the left hand and the right hand would be difficult. And I'm trained classically, so I can see that might be easy for you, but maybe because you've practiced it a lot. But I can see that for me, that might be not something I'm in, accustomed to doing, making up Boeings. Yeah. Do you think it would have any value from a classical technical standpoint to work on an exercise like that? I'm just curious. For left hand and right hand coordination, I think some of the, the most common things I hear from people about, oh, they're playing, they struggle with left hand and right hand coordination. That when the left hand plays, there's this miscoordination with the bow. So to force yourself to create some kind of bowing. <laughs> I, I just making up bowings on the spot, but mine are coming out very trained as if I'm playing, I don't know, Galamian or a Kreutzer etude, and that's not a bad thing. But um, yeah, to see where the left hand is not clean with the, when matching up with the bow, that's actually very handy to do. But I'm just curious, do you have a, a method of how you create the bowings, or are you predetermining before you, or are you just coming in the, in the split second that you're playing them? I'm trying to randomize it as much as possible, but I think that if we think in terms of four note cells, then mathematically it's like you can either have three slurred, one separate, two slurred, two separate. And sometimes just thinking about it or doing it more slowly and then eventually getting more fluent with that. But if you want to randomize it, three plus one, two plus two, three plus right. two, you just apply to three plus two, that's to five. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> two plus but two, do one plus three. In the moment, or you actually predetermine them when you, when you play? No, I do it in the moment. That's what I figured. That that's something I would think would be a difficult thing for a classical player. But it can be practiced slowly and then worked up to. And if that's the only thing that we practice, just do this exercise for three, four minutes, it can get more comfortable right over time. The, the two things so far, one was less bow, <laughs> hooking the bow and slurring the bow more. And then the third thing was practicing improvising the bow. And now I want to talk about bite. So, oh, articulation. I'll be interested to get your take on this. So I feel like even if I go back to that swan, my theory is that at the beginning of each of these notes, there's actually a bite that becomes softened, but I'm going to, I'm going to over express that bite right now. We get that bite and I call it a consonant K. It's like, a K, yeah. right. And if we put our hair on the string, rather we put weight in the string and then we pull we get this. And that to oh. me is like the bite. And so one of the things that I like to recommend for people to practice is just getting the bite at the beginning of every note. So I'm really biting hard. I'm over exaggerating it right now. What do you think about that recommendation? I totally agree because we all have the same idea about bite. And so I call it contact. You're basically demonstrating what I've been trying to get my students to do as well, be aware of the contact between the hair of the bow and the string. So I actually have what I call the four C's of bow technique. We were talking about long tones and long bow. So that's why I have two of my four C's are being calm and consistent with the bow, but the third one is contact. And that's what you're talking about, bite. That's like a cut, almost like you're taking a knife to cheese. So that's how I sometimes think of it. Sometimes I say, okay, can you find that contact? They can't find it. So I ask them to put the bow on and pretend that this knife is cutting through a, a chunk of cheddar cheese. And then I often see people do that and they get this, <laughs> this cracking, crunchy sound. I like to think about finding that bite. You said to find weight, which is exactly how I think of it too. So sometimes I get people to think about melting grilled cheese on the pan. You just melt and you're not applying pressure where you're actually raising your elbow and applying this arm weight. And that's when you get that, right? This kind of sound. Using weight for the bow to sink, weight for your arm to sink, like you're melting a grilled cheese sandwich. Mm. And then you pull. And so whether it is. So even this, even that note, I'm feeling that the knife is cutting through the cheese. And that's how I find weight, melt. Maybe the knife melts into the cheese or you're waiting for the, the melting to happen. That's how I find weight and contact. So for me, it's calm, consistent, control of the boat and contact. So 
now we're really talking about foundational aspects of Boeing and sound production, which I'm sure are the same for both of us. But I find with a lot of times with fiddle players and intermediate players of all levels, and I wonder if you see this or not, because you work with a lot of very advanced classical players, but I see a lot of times where people are, the way I would describe it is that they're kind of balancing. They're like holding the bow above the string. And I think the reason is because they're worried that it's going to do this skipping thing when they're on an up bow. And so I try to really encourage people to get the bite so that, because I just think people are afraid of putting weight on the string. Do you see that a lot or not? Not actually, but I think that's actually calling back to the, the whole contact thing, right? You don't be afraid to put the bow on and let it melt or sink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cut to the string. Another thing that I think that comes to mind when you're talking about people are afraid and they're hovering. So it tells me that they're using some kind of muscles to keep the arm hovered over the string. If you're allowing, I like to, to use the word allow, if you allow, and I go, I always teach my students to find going to the back body, the back muscles. If I picture the shoulder blade and you picture the, the latissimus dorsi rhomboids, all these muscles, and you just picture them softening, feeling very ha heavy, feeling very relaxed. That's a great way to find more contact without pushing, right? So if you allow and, and just sense that it starts with, for me, when I look at my own bow technique and my students' bow technique, we do a lot of body scanning where I'm just going to pull a open string and sense, just observe and sense the muscles. And if I sense, let's say, this pectoral muscle, on, it's going to do that, that creates a pronation, an internal rotation. There, my sound starts to crunch. Wow. But if I start to bring my observation to the back body, my shoulder, my right shoulder blade, and just picture what it looks like, the shoulder blade looks like, I don't think I'm hovering over this string. Because if I hover, that means I'm engaging this muscle. We have levator scapulae that raise the collarbone and the uh, shoulder blade up for bow technique, right? We need this to raise this up. And so it's, for me, if you're saying that someone's hovering over the string, they're using some kind of neck muscle here or muscle to elevate the arm. So if you just allow that to soften and sink and relax, then you, the bow can sit, use gravity. I'm no longer hovering, I'm no longer afraid. I'm just letting gravity do help me with my bow technique. And hopefully that long tone will become easy and at more effortless. And I don't know how many students have problems with injury but I've seen and worked with a couple of violinists who say that I just feel so tight me too I've had injury as well and I've had to yeah. observe a lot about what muscles I'm actually using what while I'm playing when I get a hard passage I get I tense up so I, I do a lot of that for myself I, oh my gosh I'm actually not breathing oh wow I'm actually tensing my neck so I'll help my students be, be aware of that if a person's having trouble with that long tone they're definitely tensing. They're definitely tensing muscles that they don't need. So we want effortless playing. An effortless play comes from a relaxed body. So I like to infuse the way we play and practice with a lot of body awareness. I think that will solve a lot of technical issues and a lot of pain. That's amazing. Different. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. The last thing I'll share about quote unquote jazz bowing technique or fiddle bowing technique, right? Where I feel like it diverges from classical music. I mean, my son right now is working on Mozart G major. And so he's got all these things where there's like lifting and, you know. Oh, these are all places where we lift the bow off the string and set it down very daintily or lightly and where we're not Control necessarily having... Grace. What's that? Control and grace. Right, yeah, exactly. Control and grace. I, I don't even know what the word... What's this? Like brushing? Not to mention... Wherever we have these, you know... <laughs> yes. All these kinds of classical bow strokes, right, that involve yeah. lifting, bouncing, brushing, and various gradations. So my whole thing is don't take the bow off the string, right? So if I go back to this, if I go back to this thing, I just want you to notice that my bow never leaves the string. 
So my bow stays on the string the whole time. Constant contact. I love it. It's, it looks so efficient. And and I, it compares so nicely with just allowing the bow technique, the bow arm, to just sit. Find gravity. And just allow that bow to sit. It's just, just a very cool way of playing. And you're right. that like Mozart, it's all about brushed stroke and... And then you definitely have to use a lot of that scooping brush... Uh, brushing approach because no longer are you cutting anymore right or if you wanted to i mean all this is all cut it's, it's a form of cut but you can actually soften that cut until you get to this brush yeah you can definitely get into that cut where you soften the cut until it becomes a brush and then you start getting into scoop shape which you clearly don't need when you improvise a jazz style, right? I feel like I don't necessarily need it. Of course, there's beauty in all these articulations, all these sounds, all these shapes that we can make, right? But I feel a lot of times if I'm playing jazz or improvising in any style, I feel like the rhythm is important and we're improvising so we don't have as much time to think about it. So we have to put energy into designing musical phrases that are rhythmic, that are complete ideas. And I see this as a struggle with a lot of classical players who try to improvise is that they're using so much bow. They're trying to use all these different techniques. And so they're, it's not really as rhythmically as exact as it would be if the bow was just on the string. And then, so then if we compromise our rhythm, like if we're making a choice between having a brush articulation versus like clear rhythm, I feel like I would take clear rhythm every day. I see that too in my students because I just literally get, came out of a couple of classes and it was my students and we just focused on pulse and rhythm. And I said that at the top of the class. I said, listen, jazz musicians spend a lot of time learning how to play in time, in the pocket, with rhythm. And so we were working on orchestral excerpts and I said, no, 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 you're gonna get it right in the center of the beat. And they, they're so focused on articulation, sound production, and uh, intonation, right? And right. You're right. all of that takes a lot of energy and a lot of practice. And then we don't have time to really get with the metronome and get with the pulse. And so I actually started doing some rhythm exercises so that it's patterns of two, three, fives, and just instead of. It was just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, for example. And we just do. Wait. Like two plus three, three plus two, blowing uh, patterns. Like they can start to feel the inner subdivisions. And so yeah. it's a challenging exercise. But once I started practicing that exercise, which I got from a bass player, Roberto Acapinti, and he called it Bobby's Beat Builders, really started to help me figure out how to get inside the inner beats. And that helped build my um, subdivisions. But yeah, that was really enlightening for me because as a classical player, I had never done that exercise. I had never worked on inner subdivisions, working on my rhythm and having it very rock solid. And that was very enlightening for me. So when I brought it to my classical players in my class, it was also very challenging for them as well. Because all we do is work on intonation, pitch, and articulation, sound production. I totally agree with you. Your focus is here, and you don't have time to work on the other stuff, right? Mm. And for you, your focus is on rhythm, getting in the pocket, complete phrases, and style. For us, it's all about the other end of the spectrum. It's cool to blend the two. I like what you're saying because part of becoming a musician is actually about prioritizing. And so I think that's what you're talking about right now. Between articulation, rhythm, intonation, where is our priority? Because literally we can't really put our energy on a thousand things. So we do have to make some choices. And if I go back and play a classical concert, which occasionally I do, then I'm gonna work on some of those other things, those brush strokes. But most of the time when I'm practicing, I'm thinking about what are the most important things that I can work on and how can I consolidate my practice so it addresses all those things sufficiently. And I'm leaving some things out. So that might include, in my case, it might mean that I'm not working on vibrato as hard. Right. 
it also may mean that I'm not working on all these like bouncing bows or definitely not low and down no. the you know, okay. or, ten or tenths. No. Do I really need to work on tenths? But I can understand how if someone's have to play Paganini or they have to do an orchestral audition, maybe they would do tenths or maybe they would do up bow staccatos. Certainly Hilary Hahn has to work on that. Probably you do with your type of concertizing stuff. I agree with you. An Olympian to stand on their head and say, prove it, you can stand on your head. Maybe you need that for Cirque du Soleil level. But to be, let's say, a professional teacher, do you really need to master tenths and upper staccato? I don't think so. Yeah, mm. sure. If you want to elevate your technique and challenge yourself, I think learning those techniques can elevate your overall technique for sure. But do you have to master tenths? Do you have to demonstrate that you can play tenths in Pagnina Caprice to be a professional violinist? I beg to differ. I don't think it's necessary. Yes, study it to just further your technical expertise and your ability, absolutely. Up with staccato, you don't need to prove that you can do up with staccato. Study it, yes, to learn what we talked about, the control of the bow, bite, finding bite. If that's how you're going to learn bite, sure, you're cross-training, right? You're going to get an Olympian athlete who cross-trains in swimming and uh, football and whatever, javelin throwing, whatever. They don't have to be pros at all of those disciplines, but if by training in other disciplines, you're going to gain other skills. You're going to take those skills and transfer them over to your main discipline, which is whatever you want it to be. So if learning up with staccato is not necessary, at least it can serve the, the, the purpose of being a, a pedagogical exercise, which can improve your overall technique. I love it. I love it. Everybody listening, check out Dr. Lynn Kuo. Go to lynquo.com. She's got a great PDF that'll help you with your practicing. It's totally free. You can opt in at lynquo.com. That's L-Y-N-N-K-U-O. And also all look for Lynn Quo on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. She has really amazing videos on her YouTube channel. They're really great. We'll link to it here on the YouTube. We'll link to it in the podcast notes and in the blog here at christianhouse.com. Reach out to Lynn if you're interested in learning great stuff from her. And if you are checking this out or checking me out and wondering how can you work with me, check out more here on the podcast and go to christianhouse.com for all kinds of free resources and check out our live events, our Zoom classes, play-along videos, and more. Thank you so much, Lynn, for doing this. Thanks for having me. That was great.